and hello and welcome into Views from the Sidelines. I'm your host, Joey Tysick, my partner, Malik Hill. And uh, it's another gloomy, ugly day in Michigan, to say the least. Uh, it's supposed to storm basically all day. We got tornado watches here and there, actually. Um, it's crazy, but we're here to talk about more sports, as always. Uh, college basketball is done for the season. Both national championships have concluded. And so we'll get to those. We have some more NFL draft talk. And then the NBA standings are basically coming to a close. And it's interesting. We got some fun teams that we talked about last week. And we have some teams that we don't like so much that are going to probably be in. Um, But we'll get to that towards the end. So starting off NCAA championships, basketball season is over for college. It's unfortunate. March Madness goes quick. And the Yukon Huskies, for the men's title, they uh, made it look easy, to be honest. And they now have secured their fifth title in the last 25 seasons. That is more than any other school, more than Duke, more than North Carolina. And I think they need to be given some credit now. I, I feel like they've flown under the radar for a while. They're, they're a blue blood. Would you agree? Like they're just, it's it's kind of hard to dictate what they are because they're in between like blue blood and new blood. <laughs> it's so weird. Like they've been a, a quality program for years, but they didn't hit the championship ceiling until like the mid to late nineties, and they've won five since ninety nine. Right. So that's like the like the Michigan State area where like. Some people call them a blue blood. I, I call them, some people call them a new blood because. Right. But yeah, it's, I, I'll call them a blue blood. I will. Yeah. Because they, they've been good, consistently good for so long that I'd say they deserve it. And there are fans from other programs saying stuff like they, they always get, they always have easy runs when they win championships. It's, it's always, I, I, I don't read into that stuff because. If that was true, several other schools should have won some championships by now. They're not the only school that's had "quote unquote" easy runs or the schedule set up well for them to make a championship run. Michigan State has had that at some points. There are other schools too, but I just wanted to name Michigan State. Yeah, but <laughs> I I'll, I kind of said the Michigan State fans are some of the ones that were saying UConn got another easy run, but once you get to five. In like 25 years. Right. That's real. Mm -hmm. The talent is there. They always find coaches that keep them in a good place. And now they did it again with Danny Hurley. And, yeah, like you said, they won every game by double digits. Mm -hmm. It it was impressive. They were on point every game. It it was really cool to see. It was cool to see the former players there, too, like Kimball Walker, Charlie Villanueva, Rudy Gay. They were there. Right. In attendance to see the game. So, yeah, always good to see the old All-Americans and the greats from UConn. Yeah. It's kind of weird for me because I was kind of saying this in our group chat a little bit. It's just weird that, like, UConn kind of appears every so many years, yeah. and then they just make some magical runs. They're never a one or two seed when they make their runs. Yeah. They, we always know they have at least one or two guys that are really good. Right. But nobody picks them to win it mm-hmm. outside of UConn. <laughs> yeah. And I'll be honest, I didn't watch most of this game because I just had a feeling UConn was just going to run run through San Diego State, unfortunately. Um, and it was very – it was kind of boring. It was on a Monday night. I kind of – did The time of the game. They, yeah. Yeah. Like, I feel like I got to change something. Um, but luckily on Sunday, there was actually a much more exciting game, the women's national title game. Yeah. Iowa taking on LSU. All the talk about Caitlin Clark because she's kind of just burst onto the scene for she's, women's she's basketball. She's been unconscious for most of the year. And in the first half of this game, she pretty much was too. Yeah. She started 4-4 four, four for I, three. I think that was all in the first quarter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we thought she was going to have another crazy 40-point game. Um, but LSU kind of stepped it up on defense. And there were... I think in the second quarter, one of LSU's bench players, like her name is escaping me at the moment, but she hit like Jasmine Carson. 
Yes. She hit like yeah. four or five threes or something in a short span. She hit one to end the half where she just like ran off a screen, threw it at the rim, and it went, it banked in. Yeah. And then in the second half, what is it Alexis Morris? Yeah, she took over. She's the one that kind of took over in the second half, had like 20-something in the second half. Um, I think LSU finished with three girls that had um, 20-plus points, I believe. Yes. And then, of course, Angel Reese, kind of their big-name player, she finished with like 15 and 10 or something like that. Yeah, LSU shot 64.7, basically 65% from three. Yeah. 102 points. They were just rolling. It was crazy. And 54% from the field. Yeah. And it was just, it was a fun game. Both teams were kind of making runs. Iowa did come back a little bit, but the gap was just kind of too big early in the second half. And they never made it up. I will agree with some people that the the refs, I don't think the refs like affected the game necessarily, but it was annoying to watch. They, they were calling every little call in the second half. Yeah. So, I, like, I don't think it really changed the outcome of the game necessarily. Um, you could argue, I guess, that, like, the Caitlin Clark technical was pretty hurtful. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I think LSU was just the better team that day. Um, but it just ruined the flow of the, the, flow of the game. Uh, and that's kind of the big upsetting part about it. But, unfortunately, because of this game being so hyped up, and there was a lot of storylines going into it. LSU felt like uh, Caitlin Clark disrespected South Carolina for waving off a shooter, even though she's a really bad shooter, so I don't blame her. Um, I do that on the ba- the daily when I used to play. Um, but the big controversy at the end of the game was Angel Reese giving the John Cena, you can't see me, to Caitlin Clark, pointing at her ring finger, saying, we got the ring, basically, and then kind of following her around for a little bit afterwards and twitter and everything just just blew up yeah um what what's your take on this malik it it makes me sad and not really angry but just just i'm i'm tired of the fact that people care about this Mm -hmm. and the fact that people don't just i fully embrace and love trash talk i love talking if you can back it up Mm mm-hmm I love getting in people's faces. I love physical, all of that. I love every single bit of it. Yeah. Which is why I don't really love regular season NBA basketball, which is why I hate the way basketball is ref today. I, It's physically soft. Now they're, they, they want to take down intensity. They want to take all emotion and fire. They're taking all of it out of the game. And when things like this happen, people overreact because they don't see it anymore. Yeah. Stuff like this used to be normal. Mm -hmm. You dunk on somebody, you get in their face, they fall on the ground, you almost, you walk over them. If they retaliate, then the ref just breaks them up and they just continue the game. Yeah. No texts. Maybe somebody gets a foul. Keep playing basketball. Let's go. Yeah. Now you get in somebody's face and you do the, you can't see me. I, who cares? Listen, she did it for like 10, 15 seconds, yeah. maybe even 20. I don't care. Mm-hmm. I do not care. She had 15 and 10. Most people expected Caitlin Clark to just go off on them. And it was a like comeback from Caitlin Clark doing it in the last game. I don't care if it was com- very different situations Yeah, where Caitlin Clark looked at their bench and did it. Mm-hmm. She did it. Right. They both did the same thing. Mm-hmm. My – so – uh, I I love every bit of what she did. I love what they both did. Yeah. And Caitlin Clark said in the post game, I respect Angel Reese and I don't mind that she did it because we're competitors. Yeah. That's it. Mm-hmm. That is all it is. I want high level, fiery, tough, physical competition. Yeah. And people get mad when they see that now. Right. Yeah, I'm not going to argue with you because, I mean, people are saying that it's classless and stuff like that. It, Obviously, uh, they haven't watched basketball before. Listen. I'll tell you, you go to a, a local YMCA, that's classless. <laughs> there are some, Dudes that haven't played basketball yeah. since their freshman years of high school. You will hear some things people say. Following like Dennis Rodman and saying yeah. insane, that, that is disrespectful to the game. Right. Them. <laughs> you know, people that have played basketball like you and I before, We, I think we've probably seen it before. Um, 
And the only thing that I'll, I will say that I didn't like, and I don't have a problem with it, is that when she was doing it at the free throw line, I was kind of laughing. The problem was at the very end of the game when Angel Reese is kind of like following her around following Caitlin Clark around and like still doing it. It was childish. It's like corny. It was childish. <laughs> Which is just, I was laughing more at Angel Reese in that scenario where at first I was yeah. like, oh, this is funny. I, I had a smile on my face because I felt, I found it funny in the moment too. It was some kid stuff to do. I was like, whoa, but, settle listen, down. I don't care. She, she, she could be 18. They're right. kids. They're She's not, a sophomore. They're not full grown adults. Yeah. That's what people forget. She's 6'3". That don't make her an adult. Yeah. She's a kid. A very intense, fierce competitor. Right. And in the moment, she just felt like putting it in Caitlin, Caitlin Clark's face. Yeah. I don't care. Right. That doesn't make her a bad person. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean she has no class off the court. Yeah. I, I just, I don't, I don't understand why people can't separate it. Right. I, I don't get it. Yeah. And the funny thing is, too, is like, uh, at first I was like, okay, that's pretty cool. That's pretty funny what Angel Reese is doing at the free throw line. Then I, sh- then I thought, okay, this is getting a little corny. We're going a little too far. But then, uh, I believe it was this morning, she answered an interview question because there's the the debate about, I think, I don't even know, the, is is it Jill Biden? Yeah, yeah Jill, <laughs> Jill Biden said both teams should come to the White yeah. House out of sportsmanship, which nobody has ever said right. <laughs> about teams coming to the White House. Yeah, and Angel Reese kind of said that that's, a terrible idea and dumb and I actually became like an Angel Reese fan after that because before I was kind of like all right she's getting a little corny a little childish I don't really care for her game watching her she's good but she's not my cup of tea watching at least um but this morning watching that I was like that's that's pretty cool that she like she's not afraid to speak her mind which is cool because you don't get that very often and if she wants to be the villain of like college basketball next year, love it. Totally down for it. Listen, Ed, people have been saying the WNBA needs to make her and Caitlin Clark the burden magic exactly. of the WNBA. Do you do you think the NCAA like they need to make that a game next year? Yes. Before the tournament. It needs to be a primetime game. Listen, send them to <laughs> Iowa. Right. Send LSU to Iowa. Exactly. I need it in my life. Something like that. Because it was fun to watch. And that's the only thing that stinks is like this whole controversy basically made it so that we're not talking about LSU. We're not talking about the girls that they had 20 plus points apiece. That's my only, that's my only maybe other problem with the Angel Reese stuff is that like her following Caitlin Clark around basically made it so that people aren't focused on the game. And now that's not entirely her fault, but at the same time, like her teammates had such good games that that kind of elevated their team in that uh, scenario, and people aren't going to talk about it, which stinks, for them at least. Um, but at the end of the day, they won the national title game. Women's college, yeah. like, women's basketball like, is on the rise a little bit. Yeah. Kim Mulkey is an excellent coach. She won three championships at Baylor, comes home to Louisiana, and within two years wins the first one for LSU. That was an awesome story. She did probably deserve a tech, though, for standing on the court. Listen, I listen. <laughs> I love how insanely intense she is as a coach. Some pe- I there were a lot of people on social media that I know never watch women's basketball and have never seen Kim Mulkey. Yeah, I've been watching Kim Mulkey coach since like the 2010s. Yeah, she's been this way forever. That's why I was surprised. This that is literally this is her. I kind of didn't even like because I don't follow uh, women's basketball, unfortunately. Um, but like when I saw her on the bench, I was like, wait a minute, she coaches LSU now. Like, she's actually recognizable as a coach, which yeah. is cool. Um, but to me, it, it, she kind of toes the line of, like, She does do too much at intensity times. Intensity. Like, and, earlier this season, that clip that went viral of her literally, like, almost attacking a ref. Yeah. Like, running after them and screaming. She gets that intense sometimes. Right. And it's too much. Yeah. But hey, it happens. Right. So, MSU fans, if you're hating on her, then you better hate on Izzo, too. Because he, <laughs> he does that kind of stuff sometimes. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it's a good time. And then, uh, don't worry. That's below us. Okay. <laughs> it's not picking up on the audio. Weird sounds Sorry. coming from outside. They're doing like maintenance in the basement, I think. Um, but no, it, it doesn't pick up. Um, is there anything else that you want to take away from college basketball this season at all? 
Um, before we go to the bigger MSU or Michigan news, well, this, bigger. I'd, I'd say this was probably the most chaotic men's tournament I've seen. I enjoyed the season throughout, honestly. Mm. The rise of FAU. I've, I've heard some really ridiculous FAU takes about are you, how. Are you talking about the Will Compton thing? <laughs> My brother and I talked about that this morning. Just people that don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. We talked about FAU during team. the season. You know, they, they were a top twenty-five thirty and two. <laughs> yeah, they were a top twenty-five yeah. team at one point. Yeah, people that know college basketball know FAU was good. Mm. I loved the Marquise Noel of it all, the Mister New York City stuff. Yeah, all the storyline, even MSU making making it to the Sweet Sixteen and having that classic game was awesome. Mm-hmm. It was, it was it was really fun. I didn't miss North Carolina. Nope. Like I I just enjoyed what this tournament was. I don't need the in, it, huge brand names. Just give me good basketball. Yeah. And the upsets were all there. Right. Speaking of North Carolina, I I don't remember if we talked about Armando Baycott coming back. Um listen, he's he's making more money at UNC than he will in the pros, so yeah. good for him. Um so that one's interesting. But the other interesting bit, his teammate Caleb Love entered the transfer portal. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think UNC is going to really get any better. I mean, now I don't know about their recruiting, their scouting stuff. Some some of their freshman players that didn't play a lot have transferred. Mm-hmm. I think like three guys. Okay. But I, I don't know how big of how big they would have been in the yeah, grand scheme of things. Right. Um. But also entering the transfer portal, Michigan Wolverine Hunter Dickinson. Man, how the mighty have fallen. A couple years ago, probably would have been a lottery pick in the NBA. He was in the Final Four as a freshman. And now he's a fifth year going into the transfer portal. I, th- I think he's I think he's a fourth, fourth, year, year? fourth year junior. Okay. Yeah. Um, or just third year. I can't remember. He's a junior. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know something that I heard is like he's graduating early so that he's basically playing basketball just next year. That's all he's doing. Um, so I'm sure he's also going to be making plenty of money. Yes. Um, and Especially just training. If, if the coach he goes and plays for allows him to keep that personality and keep talking, Yeah, I'm sure the fans there will eat it up. Right. Now you have some speculation where you think he will go. Correct? Oh, yeah. I, he, he's a DMV kid. Every time he's gone against Maryland, he's destroyed them mm-hmm. just based off the fact that they didn't give him an offer. Ed Cooley is at Georgetown. He's trying to get things turned around pretty quickly because that's what Georgetown fans want, and that's what he expects. Right. I'm pretty sure he's going to go for Hunter Dickinson, Hmm. and I wouldn't be surprised if he ended up at Georgetown. Back home, but not at Maryland. Can Honestly, a lot will still be on his shoulders, so he'll still put up some numbers in the Big East. Yeah. Big East just had a great year in basketball. Mm Mm-hmm. And, yeah, I think the the NIL money will be at a higher level if he goes home and does well for Georgetown because that fan base is in a bad place right now, and they want nothing more than to see their team good again. Yeah. If they're even average and Hunter Dickinson is playing great, they're going to give him all the love in the world. Right. Um, But that's if he goes. It's just a prediction. Right. Yeah. We don't really know. Where anybody's going, yeah. obviously. Um, so that'll be interesting for Michigan because who, who's going to replace that? Listen, Terrace Reed is going to be the starting center, and Doug McDaniel are going to be the, is going to be the starting point guard. That's the only set things I know about this team. Yeah, and they they just got Namari Burnett from Alabama, who's had two injuries, mm-hmm. major in his college career. Former five star that hasn't gotten it fully on track. Yeah. He can shoot, and he That's transferred all, into yeah. Alabama. Kids can he can shoot. That's all I really know. Mm-hmm. He had some yeah. good some good games, um, but yeah, injury might be a problem. Yeah, it's a it's a do or die season for Jawan. Yeah, and it's it's yeah. probably going to be a tough one. He has more work to do in the transfer portal. Uh, underwhelming, but a, a good but underwhelming recruiting class coming in. Yeah. Because you're also in the boat that Jet Howard's going to leave, right? Because he's going yeah. to the draft. Okay. Yeah. Kobe Bufkin announced already. Yeah. And he waived his eligibility. Right. Hired an agent. Mm-hmm. So your scores are gone. Yep. Good luck. 
And then on the same on the same side, Michigan State they lost Joey Hauser. I think we kind of talked about it briefly, but um, they are going to need somebody. Um, Even though they have the most hype recruiting class they've had in like five six years, yeah. Tom are, Izzo needs to go into the transfer portal. They are still just guards. And why go get a score? They are still just go get a score. A small team. You have Jade Nakins, but you still go get another one. Yeah. Um, and I big. mentioned it to you off the podcast. Western Kentucky has a seven foot five Jamarian center Sharp. that uh, he's entered the transfer portal. Tom Izzo, I know you're against the, the transfer portal, but if you could go get a seven five shot blocking big, just do it. <laughs> just Listen. do it. Get some something. To now try he to may fight he may have other offers, but if you could get a guy like that, yeah, I, I think that would make this team have some potential. I'm not going to say anything outlandish, but that would that'd be a lot of potential on that team. Go get Ishma Sood from Kansas State, mm. the sniper that knocked down almost every three in the tournament. Is he in the portal? Yeah. Go get Ishma Sood too. You just lost Joey Hauser. Yeah. Get a shooter, another scorer, and another big. That can defend. Because Jackson Kohler will be able to score. He's not going to defend much. Yeah. I don't know. It, Izzo's so against the portal that I, I can't see it happening. Can't see it happening. But we'll see. We'll see. All right, moving on to the NFL draft stuff. Um, we wanted Last week, we kind of talked about some quarterbacks and a lot of the, the big names at the top. Uh, so today we're going to go over some of the skill position guys um, towards the top as well and then get into more of Lions picks, who we want the Lions to take, who we think the Lions will take, um, things like that. So starting off with the skill positions, I wanted to talk about the running back, B. John Robinson. He's one of the biggest prospects we've had in years, probably since Saquon Barkley. Um, and all of his metrics line up perfectly, breaks lots of tackles, runs for lots of yards, and he's strong, He's fast. got everything you want. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. How high do you think he can go in this draft? I'd be shocked if he doesn't go top 10. Wow. Honestly. The, the, the NFL has become the theory of you don't take a running back top 10 because the value sucks. Right. But I still think teams are – they'd still want a level of talent like B. John Robinson. Because he is just as good of a project as Saquon Barkley was. He's just as good as Zeke Elliott. Like, it, he's he is the complete running back. Mm -hmm. He could go outside of the top ten because of that value thing that does right. make some sense. But his level of talent can't be ignored. And as long as everything checks out, which I'm sure his interviews are going to go well and he's healthy, him falling out of the top ten will be a shock to me because mm -hmm. he's that good. Where do you think he would go then? Uh, I have to pull up the draft so, order. So the ones that I think of off the top of my head would be like the Bears at nine or the Eagles at ten maybe. Maybe. The Bears at nine would make sense because I, I know Bears fans, they're all trying to get excited for Khalil Herbert. Mm-hmm. And they say he was better than David Montgomery last year. He, he'll never be the type of guy that breaks open games for you. Mm -hmm. And you need some more weapons for that offense, even though you just signed some. Getting B. John Robinson would help out Justin Fields a ton. Yeah, he would be a huge help. He can pat, he can catch out the backfield too, so he would be a huge help for that offense. Yeah, having a weapon like B. John Robinson and having Khalil Herbert for them to both rotate. Yeah. Otherwise, the, the two sneaky teams that I think, I think the Titans have too many issues to go for Bijan because of all the, you know, there's been the Derrick Henry talk of whether they're bringing him back or if they're seeking a trade or whatever. There's a lot of rumors swirling there. That would be interesting. The other one is if he falls, which I'd be surprised if he fell this far. I think he's more of a top 20. But if he Possible. made it, if he made it to the Chargers, the Chargers, I know they just drafted Isaiah Spiller last year, um, but there's been talk, too, with Austin, Austin Eckler also, yeah. that Across he wants the out. If they just replace Austin Eckler with Bijan Robinson, that'd be yeah. 
fantastic move for them, I would think. Um, so I, I like that fit a lot. But um, yeah, I think anywhere in the top 20, people will take. And if he falls out of the top 20, some of these playoff teams could get a big, big player um, that could help their team. Like people are talking about the Cowboys because the Cowboys are sitting at 26. If the Cowboys made a move to maybe move up a couple spots. They like to trade up for talent. So yeah. there is a chance that they try. I would hate that so much. I'm with you. Seeing him 100%. in a Cowboys uniform, man. 100%. But, uh, you know, Texas guy, it, it makes sense. But I, I would also hate it, yes. Um, Is there any other running backs that you wanted to talk about? I was just going to basically bring up Bijan, but was there any other guy that you wanted to maybe talk about as kind of a sleeper or anything? It's it's hard to talk about a specific sleeper in this draft because I think this is such a high quality running back draft. Yeah, I agree. a class of backs that you can find like five or six quality guys that could probably start. Mm-hmm. I guess the other one Maybe we could talk more. about is Jameer Gibbs, um, yeah, out he, of Alabama. He's, he's getting the um, Alvin Kamara comp, right? Which who knows if he could live to something that high? But he's super fast, super elusive, and quick. Mm-hmm. Put the ball in his hands. That's whether it's like slot receiver, running back, returning, you just need to get the ball in his hands yeah. so he can make things happen. I'm a fan of Sean Tucker from Syracuse. He put up a ton of yards. They didn't use him as much as they should have last year. He's a really good back, powerful, fast. Mm-hmm. Roshan Johnson, who shared carries with uh, B. John Robinson at Texas, yep. a big physical back that could take pressure off of like a main guy. Right. He could be a great number two guy. I think Zach Charbonnet could be a starter in the NFL. You're a guy. I think, yeah, originally from Michigan, yeah. finished at UCLA, put up big production, really good numbers at UCLA. Mm-hmm. Really good size, uh, like 6'1", 215. Gives you everything you need, included blocking. But it's, they're just there are so many guys that you could take in this draft. I think there will be a lot of running backs on the second and third day of the draft. Yeah. I even like some of the back end guys, um, some of the smaller guys too, like Evan Hull, Kendra Miller. I think they're kind of, they have some sneaky upside that they could be good on on uh, certain teams. Definitely. And then, then there's like the other kind of sneaky guys too, like you forget about Lou Nichols out of Central Michigan, leading the nation last year, having not as good of a season this year. Um, Chase Brown out, out of Illinois is there. Yes. He had the most rushing yards in the Big Ten, almost was a Heisman contender. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say Muhammad Ibrahim. I like him a lot. He's had so much wear and tear. Yes, that would and be. And he's gotten so many carries in college. Yes, that's the scary part. Yeah. Um, now, for a team that maybe, you know, is running for a title, he's a good swing to take um, because he is talented. But, yes, I was going to bring up the exact same thing, that he has a lot of wear and tear on his body. Yeah. Don't know how much he'll last in the NFL. I actually, I will bring up two guys that I'd, I'd say are my favorites in like the bottom half. Okay. Kalen Laybourne out of Marshall was a five star guy coming out of high school, went to Florida State. Things didn't work out there. Injuries, a little bit of trouble. I think he sat out of, of playing football for like a year. Mm-hmm. And then he transfers to Marshall when they get a new head coach and he rushes for like 1,700 yards. Like, he was dominant in the CUSA, mm-hmm. and his five-star talent showed he could be a steal. And then my guy, the 5'5", Deuce Vaughn. Dynamo. I had a feeling you can bring him State. up. Deuce yeah. Vaughn can play in the NFL. Mm-hmm. He's not an every-down back. Most backs today aren't every-down backs. Right. But you can use him in screens. You can use him in the pass game, running routes. He can run it out of the backfield because even though he's 5'5", five, five, like 178 or like 180, because he's 5'5", five five, he has a strong build. Mm. He is really strong and stout. Right. And he's super quick and elusive. He's a guy that can play in the league. Yeah. People forget yeah, Darren Darren Sproles was a small back. He was built. He he lasted. Yeah. Lasted a long time. So you just gotta gotta use him properly. Right. No, I agree. Um, moving on to the wide receivers, at the top of the list is Quentin Johnston out of TCU. Big. Spectacular catch kind of guy, fast. He's everything you want in a receiver. Um, he was, he's was he been rumored to the Lions a few times. Would you hate if the Lions took Quentin Johnson? 
I have a hot take. Whether they have to move on up? Quentin Johnston. Okay. I think when you look at his college production, he was pretty good. He was really good at times. Yep. I don't think he ever fully lived up to what his talent is. Hmm. And in my opinion, he's the fourth best receiver in this draft. Okay. I think his size and speed combination have people drooling. Yeah. And they they assume that a team can take that and turn him into a superstar with with those things. But he's not the highest level like go up and get a receiver with all the size he has. Mm-hmm. He's a guy that likes to burn defenses. He's a guy that likes to take short routes and go deep. I mean, and take it to the house. He has had some go up and get it catches, but not at a high percentage. I think Zay Flowers is better. I think Jackson Smith is better. And I think Jordan Addison are better receivers than him. Hmm. I think each of them are. And I saw a stat last week looking at the receivers in this draft. They have Josh Downs from North Carolina ranked fifth or sixth on the list of receivers. Really good guy to UNC, a lot of production. He's about five foot nine. Mm-hmm. He had a higher contested catch rate than Quentin Johnston hmm. in college. Interesting. Con- contested catching and going up and getting the ball at the highest point is a skill. Yeah. And I th- Quentin Johnston could learn it more, but he doesn't do it at a high level. Hmm. And I'm not saying Josh Downs is going to be a superstar. <laughs> right. But in college, one of his specialties was going up and getting it over people. Yeah. With his like insane athleticism and – bounce mm-hmm. at five nine he was just really good at doing it quentin johnson at six four average to below average okay so i i like quentin johnson a lot but he's not my number one guy and i don't have him top three i have him at four okay because he has a lot to build on and work on so would you do it in that order then zay flowers jackson smith and then jordan addison i personally would have jackson smith first because i i just think he is – I think he's a guy that's just going to dominate. Mm-hmm. I I think wherever you put him outside, inside in the slot, great hands, great route runner, he can he can do it all. He doesn't have many flaws, even with him being hurt from last year. Mm-hmm. His health is the reason why he's not number one. I'd have Zay Flowers too because he – some people say he has the ceiling of – um. The receiver from Seattle. Tyler Lockett? Yeah, a lot of people think it's Tyler Lockett. I think he could be even better than that. He's more elusive than Tyler Lockett. He could be just as good a route runner. He has just as good hands. You get him the ball in the open field, he makes people miss. I'm a huge fan of Zay Flowers. And Jordan Addison, people saw what he did at Pittsburgh. He won the Belitnikoff two seasons ago. Mm -hmm. Last year, Caleb Williams was the star of the team. Jordan Addison had a quality season, but not as good as the year at Pitt. He's still just as good. So mm. I, th- I honestly, I think Jordan Addison could be someone like Brandon Cooks. Yeah, just like a really good, somewhat high level receiver that like could make a few Pro Bowls, or he could be better than that. I don't know. He's very talented, but in terms of how good the receivers are right now, I think Quentin Johnston is fourth. Okay, I still like him though. What do you think about the speed, sir, Jalen Hyatt? He's a tough one because Tennessee's scheme was built for him to get open very easily. Right. And even though he does have incredible speed, some people thought he'd run 4-2 at the combine, but it was like 4-3-3, which is still elite speed. Mm -hmm. I don't know how good of a route runner he'll be. It's a, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. Could he be a taller Tavon Austin? (laughs) That's what I'm afraid of. Okay. Like, is he going to be a real receiver? Mm-hmm. Or also, um, the receiver that from Notre Dame that, that has played like two fully healthy seasons in the NFL. He was Deshaun Watson's number one guy for like a year or number 15. Can't remember his name. People will remember. Very speedy wide receiver. Has never been able to stay healthy. The only other guy that, the only guy that I ever think of is Kevin White. <laughs> talk about a bust <laughs> but yeah couldn't stay healthy in Houston traded to Miami hasn't played there yet really I I don't know if he'll be he's boomer bust to me 
Okay. He could be a tall Tavon Austin, or he could be a tall Deshaun Jackson. Okay. I don't know which one he could be. We'll have to see. He has the skills to be a tall Deshaun Jackson. He has the skills. And then two more guys I wanted to talk about. On CBS, at least, Jaden Reed is the ninth rated wide receiver. How do you feel about that? Um, I would have Nathaniel Dell, Tank Dell from Houston ahead of him, personally. I think him being 5'8", 165 is the hang-up, Nathaniel mm-hmm. Dell. He's a polished route runner and has great hands, but he's so tiny. Jaden Reed is another guy that has a higher contested catch rate than Quentin Johnston. Jaden Reed is great at going up and making those types of catches. You saw him do it mm-hmm. almost week in, week out for Michigan State. Whenever Peyton Thorne couldn't find something, he'd just throw it up to Jaden Reed, and he would come down with a lot. Jaden Reed is a good route, a really good route runner. He can return the ball also. He's a he's a really good prospect. Yeah, he should be a he should have a long career as long as he can stay healthy. He should. Cool. Um, and then the other like notable name, Kayshawn Booty. He uh, he's been a disappointment. That's why I wanted in terms to bring of, him up. <laughs> in terms of his last season and the combine, he's a guy that a lot of people said were the, was the biggest loser in the combine. Yeah, there was a lot of hype around him. Yeah, his his 40 was completely unimpressive. He didn't look very quick in drills. His hands were great for his first season at LSU. I really haven't seen it since. I don't know what it is with him. I don't know if like if it's like a mental thing. Mm-hmm. But I I don't know if he, he probably should have just waited till his pro day because – the combine wasn't impressive, and his last year at LSU wasn't either. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, I lied. One more interesting prospect that I like. Uh, what's your feelings on At Perry out of Wake Forest? I, I think At Perry could be a better pro than Jalen Hyatt. Okay, because he's a, he's the same idea as Quentin Johnston. He is six but... four, and where I where I kind of see it as a somewhat negative for Quentin Johnston. I see it as more of a positive for At Perry for some reason because it's a, Perry, discount, it's a discounted draft. At pick. Perry plays like he's six foot or five eleven, mm-hmm. and he's six foot five almost. Yeah, he's like six foot five, two hundred. He runs like he's smaller. Mm-hmm. He runs routes like he's smaller. He breaks away in the open field like he's smaller. Maybe, maybe, maybe just because it's how high Quentin Johnson is ranked. Right. At Perry, it's more yeah. of like you can take that risk, and. If he works out, great. You might have found a gold mine. Yeah, he 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 finds ways to break open so many times, and had put up great production with Sam Hartman as his quarterback at Wake Forest. Mm. I like At Perry a lot. Okay, I think he would be a huge value pick in like the fourth round. Yeah, a steal in the fifth. Yeah, I think he's yeah. listed at projected one twenty five right yeah, now. He he might drop some. He also could go like third round because. Some team could be high on him. But yeah, that's right around that area. Yeah, I like A.T. Perry a lot. Cool. I'm a fan of him. Um, any other guys that you want to mention, bring up? Uh, I will go with two guys that I like a lot. Actually, three. Dontavian Wicks out of Virginia. Two seasons ago, when Virginia was running like an air raid type of offense, he had a very impressive season, and they put up a lot of numbers. Last year, they changed the offense with a new head coach, and things kind of went downhill. He still made some good plays, but I think he has a lot of talent. He's like 6'2", 205. I think he'd be a quality guy. Puka Nakua from BYU, former borderline five-star, started at Washington, ended up at BYU. Had two quality seasons for BYU, but never had that like huge breakout season. Mm -hmm. He has a ton of speed and has really good hands. He could be a really good weapon in a in many offenses. And the one guy I want to bring up the most is Xavier Hutchinson from Iowa State. Most prolific receiver in school history. Passed up Alan Lazard last season. I think he might have the best hands hmm. of anybody in this draft. His his drop rate was extremely low all four years at Iowa State. Or three years. Really good route runner. Not crazy speed, so his separation isn't great. But in terms of like short and, in, and intermediate routes, he gets open and he catches the ball. Mm-hmm. And every now and then he can break one deep and make some really nice catches. So I think Xavier Hutchinson could be a big steal for a team. And like he could go as high as second. 
Mm -hmm. Because after the senior bowl and the combine, his numbers kind of went up. But Right. Yeah, I I most likely think he goes like third, maybe high fourth. But I like Xavier Hutchinson a lot. Nice. Um, So then moving on to just a couple tight ends. Um, Shouts out to Ronnie Bell, too. Yeah. Um, Because... There are two solid tight ends in this class. I mean, there's a couple. Um, well, but there's there's one that's made a huge jump yeah. to maybe first round because of his yeah, measurables. Yeah. Um, but the two guys that I kind of wanted to bring up is uh, Dalton Kincaid and Michael Mayer. Um, they're kind of the, I would say, the cream of the crop if you're looking for a tight end. Um, I don't know. I People keep talking about the Lions going for tight end again. No. Please don't. They have three tight ends that they all made work last year. Yeah. That were young. Mm -hmm. Just keep them. Um, But if you're a team looking for a tight end, which one are you going with? Because Michael Mayer was hyped up for a while, and Dalton Kincaid is the one that's kind of been rising up. So I would go Dalton Kincaid. I think he's a better pro prospect. He was was a huge chunk of of what Utah did on offense. Their game when they upset USC last year, I think he had 18 catches Mm -hmm. for like 165 yards and two touchdowns. He gets open nonstop. Yeah. Like he he knows where to find those holes in the defense to get open and keep getting open over and over again. And he's very athletic. I like Dalton Kincaid a lot. Michael Mayer, I was more impressed with him as like a freshman and sophomore. Mm -hmm. His junior season – I think his lack of speed and quickness kind of like started to open, even though he's still a great route runner and has great hands. Right. I don't have Michael Mayer as my second best tight end in this draft. Mm -hmm. I would rather have Sam Laporta from Iowa. Okay. I think he's another Iowa tight end, first of all. What, What Iowa tight end doesn't hit. But he's more athletic than Michael Mayer. I think he's just as good of a receiver. He has more of those like standout splash plays where it's like he catches a six yard drag route and takes it like twenty yards. Yeah. Like breaking tackles and making people miss. And you're like, where is why don't why doesn't Iowa do this more? And they're Iowa, so you understand why. Yeah. But yeah, I I like Sam Laporta more. And then when you you put Michael Mayer up up beside Darnell Washington, mm-hmm. who would you take in, if you're an NFL team? Darnell Washington doesn't have the pro- the production. Yeah, it's kind of. They played him as a blocking tight end for three years, and he embraced it and became a great blocker. That's what I would and say. And then he went to the combine and showed everybody, I'm a great pass catcher too. Right. They just didn't use me as that. And there's a lot of, like, sometimes, you know, it's like, oh, the measurables don't matter. But in this case, like, the dude's six seven, two, almost 270. He's known for blocking, so if that's a – a yeah, thing that your team needs, blocker. that's usually important. But if he, you also learn that he can do more than blocking. And when the ball is in his hands, it's even more terrifying. <laughs> right. You think of just like a bigger George Kittle, basically. Because George Kittle is one of the best blocking tight ends. And then sometimes you almost forget that he's also an elite pass catcher as a tight end. So, yeah, maybe Darnell Washington could turn into that kind of thing. Um but yeah, I, I think I would take Darnell Washington just for the the upside. Yeah. And a lot of those teams that will probably be in the range of where he takes them are probably going to be near playoff teams. Um, so a lot of the times they can lock him into just that blocking tight end and eventually progress his game even more as they go. So that's just usually a lot easier. Yeah, just kind of like the receivers. The number one, great, number one ranked receiver I have fourth. Number one ranked tight end I'd also have fourth. Hmm. And I also like Michael Mayer. I think he could he could have a long productive career if he stays healthy, but I prefer the other guys. Yeah. No, I agree. Um let's see. What other You still looking at the tight end list? No, I was Oh, I was about I to was, say I could name a few guys that I like. Yeah, go for it. Gyms. I was thinking about maybe doing one more position and then going to the okay. NBA. So this is this is half Homer, half smart thinking I think Luke Schoonmaker can be a really really good NFL tight end he became one of their go-to guys in the past two seasons whenever they needed a tough catch yeah in the combine he showed he can actually run he ran four or five at the combine 
which surprised me, honestly. Mm -hmm. Still showed that his hands are strong. He was one of their best blockers. Luke Schoonmaker was. So I think he could be a reliable reliable starting tight end for a team. And then an upside guy who did produce in college, Zach Koontz. 6'7", 255 from Old Dominion. Mm. He was a high four-star guy that started out at Notre Dame, went there. Michael Mayer came in and just took over the tight end room, so he didn't have really want to stick around and be like a backup guy. Right. Follows, I think their offensive coordinator became the head coach at Old Dominion, Ricky Ronnie. Or he was one of their positional coaches. But Ricky Ronnie became the head coach for Old Dominion. He followed Ricky Ronnie. Past two seasons has been one of the best tight ends in the country in terms of production and athletic play at the tight end position. At his size and his ability to catch, I think he could be a huge surprise. Hmm. One of those tight ends that like, kind of like, I'm not saying he will be, kind of like Travis Kelsey. Mm-hmm. Nobody expected him to be anything he was when the, when the uh, Chiefs drafted him. Right. Uh, the exact Koontz has that athletic upside and the production to go along with it mm-hmm. to be a guy that just pops up in fantasy drafts like, okay, we need to take Zach Koontz because okay. this guy's productive mm-hmm. and always gets open. You hear it here first, Zach Koontz, Travis Kelsey. <laughs> Going to be the one of the, the greatest. All time. Yeah, one of the best all time. Luke Schoonmaker and Zach Koontz. Well, I mean, if you get it right, then you got a lot to say. Yeah. Um, Actually, we're not going to go into another position. Uh, the only other position I would have mentioned probably is the linebackers because we haven't really – there's quite a few good ones. Yeah. Let's, uh, we could we could do the guys that put their hands in the dirt next week. Yeah. The um, linemen on both sides. Yeah, because we did a lot of the, the top guys, but there's more than just that. But I want to get to the Lions guys really quick so we can at least mention the NBA standings and where they're at. The Lions have 6-18. and 18. First of all, do you want to keep 6-18? and 18? Or do you want to – I've heard some people package them, try to move up to maybe like three for Will Anderson to maybe guarantee that. Would you rather do that, keep 6-18, and 18, trade back? What do you want to see the Lions do? There are two scenarios. And then you can get it into the players. That I'll prefer. And this is going along with the trade uh, part of it. The first option, yes. If you could package 6-18 and 18 to get up to three and take Will Anderson, do it. Okay. Having Aiden Hutchinson on one side and Will Anderson on the other. Most Sounds teams terrifying. The, most teams in the NFL don't have that. Yeah. And they're still an up-and-coming team with a bunch of young guys. That would be terrifying if they could pull it off. Mm-hmm. So, yes, I would definitely go with that first option if possible. <clears throat> Secondly, one most Lions fans probably aren't on board with, but one I think would be a perfect scenario for this player. You keep the six pick, but you trade up out of 18 – if this guy falls, which he might not, mm-hmm. but if he falls past 10, potentially to 11 or 12, you make your sixth pick and then you trade up, you take Anthony Richardson. Hmm. See, I'm okay with that if they, if he's basically fallen. Um, I do like some of the guys that they can get at 18, but I don't mind doing another kind of high risk, high reward um, thing like they did with Jamison Williams last year. Um, as long as they don't do it at six. That's the part that I'm nervous about. Yeah, he – I don't see a better situation in the NFL for Anthony Richardson than the Detroit Lions right now. And that that's great to hear, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. A young – We're a good location. A young, extremely athletic, crazy high-ceiling quarterback stepping into a situation where he doesn't need to play right now. He can sit a year or even two years – as long as Jared Goff keeps playing highly efficient, good football, that's going to keep translating to wins. Yeah. And they're going for the division this year, so he definitely wouldn't need to play. Mm-hmm. Unless Goff got hurt, which that's a whole other thing. But even in those times, you can develop packages for Anthony Richardson because he is one of the best runners in this draft, along with having an insanely crazy arm. Yeah. With inconsistent accuracy, which is why you need to sit as a passer. But when you get close to the red zone, there's a uh, – having Ben Johnson as a coordinator, can you imagine the stuff exactly. you can draw up yeah. having Anthony Richardson come off the bench? With DeAndre Swift, 
David Montgomery, Jamison Williams. It'd be fun. It was. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie. That's that's the only thing that I would say that if they by chance wanted to get real greedy and take Anthony Richardson at six, that would be my only like positivity. Is I would think you can use him. Ben Johnson's got to have something yeah. drawn up for this. Um, that's why if you use that six pick for defense, and then you take him at eleven or twelve trading up, your offense is could be yeah. On paper, your offense could be set for the next, what, six, seven years, mm-hmm. maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sounds like you're kind of buying into I'm, the I'm a little bit Richardson. into it. Yeah. I just don't think that Anthony Richardson's going to fall. I, I think that's my my thing. I'm and, also thinking it might not happen. And, and my But some teams could get cold feet. Who knows? But I do think that he could maybe fall to six, and that's where I get nervous. Like I, I don't want to use the six pick for an offensive player, um, basically in general. If we were to stay at 6 and 18, where do you want the Lions to go? So, the Tyree Wilson thing, mm-hmm. defensive end from Texas Tech. Great size and athleticism. Solid production. All around good skill. He's not great at any one thing. Yeah. He's good at a lot and not elite at anything. I don't know if he'll ever be elite at anything. Mm hmm. Could you plug him in to start now? Maybe. He could be productive. I don't love Tyree Wilson. Mm. I like him. Okay. Do you, I think I'd have to go through risk of Jalen Carter. I, okay. Just just watching the film. That's fair. Watch, just watching what they did in college is the most important thing. Yeah. The pro day was weird, and the off-the-field stuff is a question mark. But for the past three years, they, he, he hasn't had any problems. He dominated last season and this season once he was starting. Mm-hmm. It's just been like the past five, four or five months where things have just started to go up and down a little bit. Yeah. But if you interview him and you believe in his talent and that he, you can work with him as a person, you take Jalen Carter at six. Mm-hmm. I just. What do you do at 18? Do you want to go back to back defense? I'd say go back to back defense. Okay. The question is, what do you take? What position do you take at 18? Yeah. Because if you, I'm going to look right now at the list of linebackers at eight that (laughs) that could go first round. The latest stuff that people have been talking about is this isn't like an insane running back class. There's a lot of good linebackers, but the Lions they. They've drafted well on defense, so they could hit on a guy that could start. But you don't want like another rookie linebacker starting with a bunch of young guys, and Anzalone being the one veteran. Yeah. Like, uh, so I'm I'm not sure where they would go exactly. They've they've solved the secondary issues on paper for the yeah. most part. A, a lot of the mocks have Kalaja Kansi. What position is he again? Um, is he in end technically? I'm looking at the edge. I don't see him. Jeez. Well, you know. He's listed under DL. Okay. Yeah, from Pittsburgh. Oh, him. Yeah. Oh, yeah, his testing numbers were wild. Yeah. So there's there's a chance he might not make it to 18 anymore, um, but he's been mocked to the Lions quite often. Yeah, his people are going crazy because his measurables and, like, numbers were are yeah. similar to somebody else that went to Pitt. That he will not be, he won't be Aaron Donald. Yeah. But could he be really good? Yes. Would you rather have him or Nolan Smith? Nolan Smith. Okay. Nolan Smith, his, his athleticism off the edge, it's, it's, you could drop him back as a linebacker and put him on the edge. Yeah. That's how good of an athlete he is. Mm-hmm. Like, he can go sideline to sideline. Yeah. So, that that's kind of mine. I, I Like, I would take a swing at 18, I think. If you can get one of your guys at six – whether it's Tyree Wilson, Jalen Carter, somehow Will Anderson, I don't think that's happening. Then I think you can swing on like a Nolan Smith at eighteen. I wouldn't mind that. Nolan Smith dropping eighteen would be a shock to me. Yeah, he that would be he's, incredible if the Lions yeah, got him at eighteen. He, he's another one that could could jump up. Um, drafts are going to be all over the place. Um, we'll never really know, um, but it should be interesting. Uh, I'm interested for sure. Um, we'll talk more draft next week. Like we said, maybe we'll get the guys in the trenches 
a little bit more. But with the last couple minutes here, four or five minutes, we're going to talk about the NBA, where they're at. The Eastern Conference is locked in, except for a couple positions. The 6, 7, 8 seed are not locked in fully. Um, but your play-in teams, most likely right now as it sits, Miami, Atlanta, Toronto, and Chicago. Chicago snuck in. They had a good end to their season. We know those top seeds, Milwaukee, Boston, Philly, Cleveland, and New York. We know that Cleveland will play New York in the playoffs. Should be a super exciting season or pff, series. Um, I would love to make I would love to see Brooklyn get in as the six so that they don't have to play in the play-in tournament. I think they're a fun team. The Mikael Bridges rise has been something to see. Yes. He's been unstoppable for and a it, lot of games. And another storyline, it would be Brooklyn versus Philly. That'd be a fun matchup I'd like to see. Yeah. Um, as in the play-in guys, Miami, Atlanta, Toronto, Chicago. I, I, for some reason, am drawn to Chicago. I know part of it is Vucevic and stuff. I think they're a fun team. Their defense is definitely lacking. Um, but Miami's in a weird spot, too. I Listen, I have a feeling they're still going to challenge. But they get to the playoffs, and they just start doing things. Yeah. They they would give Boston a hard time mm-hmm. in that two seven matchup. I don't. I think Boston fans kind of sweat with that first round matchup. Yeah, especially I, seeing how inconsistent Boston has been in the right. second half of the season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Boston has some weird like they could have some bad matchups coming out of the play in game. Unfortunately for them, um, so yeah, the East is basically done, and the West is still basically the Wild West, but it's kind of uh, taking its form. Yeah. Basically, the Sacramento Kings clinched that playoff yeah. and won the division. Mm-hmm. What a time to be alive. Yeah, the last time that they did that, Kenny Thomas was on their team. Anybody know who Kenny Thomas is? Probably not. We do. That's I all do. that matters. Yeah. We know Beno Udre. Yeah. We know John Salmons. Yeah. We know. Interesting time. We were there. <laughs> so they're locked in at the three. Phoenix is locked in at the four. Then we got Golden State. Both LA teams, six and seven. I can't believe the Lakers are in the seventh seed right now. I, they're they're playing well. They man. have a chance to not be in the playing tournament. They're playing really well. They actually control their destiny, I believe. Uh they can win out and uh not have to be in the play in. New Orleans looks like they're securely in, which is nice. Um Minnesota's gonna be there most likely. And then kind of vying for that last spot, OKC and Dallas. Dallas, man. They are in trouble. Kyrie's probably going to leave in the offseason. Well, uh, we pretty much predicted this when he went to Dallas. Yeah. We both agreed he's probably just leaving in the summer. Mm-hmm. And then there's OKC, who we would love to see in that play-in game. Um, I think the Western play-in games could be exciting, could yeah. be fun. Um, and then if we get like what we're stacked up to right now, we could have Golden State, Phoenix in the first round of the Western Conference. Hey. He's back. You know all that Golden State stuff that I talked about last week? How I felt like they could go on a run? I feel like Phoenix is the worst first-round matchup for them. It could be. <laughs> because of the way that Devin Booker, even Chris Paul had a huge night last night. Kevin Durant is there. And listen, Kevin Durant is there. But and they don't have Andrew Wiggins. I don't know how good he's going to be when he comes back. He's supposed to come back. But that's, that's what His appearance alone yeah. is a bat signal in the sky to me. Mm-hmm. To, to me, they had no hope when you were hyping them up. If he's back and his mind is right, they got a chance. The Warriors have a chance. But Phoenix scares me. Oh, yeah, they they should. Comparatively, they really if, should. if they played Sacramento. Yeah. So, hopefully, I think by next week we'll have the playoffs all figured out and we can start doing a little bit of a preview of the playoffs since we don't have college basketball to talk about anymore. Um, but that was it for today. Wow, that's good timing. Um more NFL next week, NBA playoff stuff. Yeah, mock draft coming up in a few weeks. Yeah, yeah. The draft starts on my birthday, April twenty seventh. It's gonna be crazy. I'll talk about the Masters next week a little bit because I'll be watching this Let weekend. Let me know because I. It's <laughs> usually I watch golf. Hopefully, usually it's a lot of fun. Um, but we, anyways, we do a little baseball update too because season just started. We'll see. Games are under three hours, Joey. How do you feel about that? I love it. Uh, maybe I'll watch a game. But this has been Views from the Sidelines. We will see you next time. I I don't think I have anything. I've got nothing this week.